going to basically sort of tag team and just set up some chairs here and have some discussions about what is it that's coming. Uh, we really believe something else is coming. That, and uh, I did a message about two weeks ago, <clears throat> and this is a, basically sort of a follow-up in a way. And so I'm not going to cover all of that again, of course. But my, the key scripture I was using was Matthew 24, 33. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. And we got a lot of all these things going on. And we talked about that, and uh, of course we got the sign of the three eclipses, and uh, the seven years from one end to the other of the eclipses, which was actually not full seven years. It was six years, six months, six weeks, and six days. So, you know, it just is. And these are the things that seem to be a part of what we've been seeing. And we're here to say, Lord, what are you, are you saying something through all of this? Because all these things are happening all but simultaneously. And we're not going to try to cover all of these. We've talked about a lot of these, but you may have some revelation. Because right now, God is using everybody in a very individual way. Have you noticed that? It's not like just, he's bringing the body together, but at the same time, he's putting different things on different people's hearts. So you don't have to handle it all. You've got to handle the part that he is putting on your heart. Because we're a body and we're working together. So yes, there's a lot of things here, but there's a lot of us. And he's showing us all different things. And it's just crazy all the things that are happening. A lot of them lining up, of course, on April 8th with the, uh, the solar eclipse, the devil comet, the CERN attempting to fire things up. And they've got the plague of locusts that's supposed to come out and uh, all sorts of interesting things all happening at the same time. But I think the theme that I keep seeing is judgment, justice, and repentance. So the, the one that I'm looking at today is I want to look at the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. And the reason that, uh, that God put that, I think, on my heart is basically I'm an engineer anyway. And I was also in quality assurance for many years. So what we study in quality assurance is to know the difference between uh, something is random and something that has a cause. And it's a statistical thing that you look at, the old uh, Six Sigma variations and so on. And the whole point of this is to say, okay, these are just random uh, things happen, you know? But then there's things are so far beyond normal statistical coincidence that you're saying something's up. Amen. And you can feel God almost touches you on things. So I said, well, Lord, there's something going on here with this. Because I look at the possibilities that this ship just happened to manage to go around the, the guard buoy that's, that's anchored there to keep you from hitting the bridge and turn itself and ran right into the bridge. And the way that it did, two pillars hit one of them and took the entire bridge down. And so I'm looking and said, there's something, this, that is just beyond random, to shut down the entire port of Baltimore, one of the largest ports we've got, and uh, a section of Highway 95, basically, is what that is. Uh, so I'm thinking, something strange. So let me look into this, Lord, and show me what you want me to show. And I encourage you that if he's showing you something, dig into it. Because it's something he wants to talk to you about and wants you to intercede for. And the reason I brought this up is this is an actual event. This is something that did happen. It's not just a schedule out there of something that might happen, this did happen. And it's beyond random to me. There's no way this ever should have happened. It just should not. As a matter of fact, if they'd done nothing, it wouldn't have hit the bridge. So we looked at this, and of course, this was the third longest trust bridge in the world, carrying about a million vehicles a month, so it's not small. But of course, we know it's the Francis Scott Key Bridge, right? which, of course, is who wrote our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. So the fact that all of this bridge collapsed, just that you can almost feel there's something there. It turns out the, the bridge is located at the spot of the Battle of Fort McHenry in uh, September 12, 1814. So they, that's literally where the battle happened, probably within 100 yards of that bridge. And that was a major turning point in that war. 
It was interesting because just 11 days prior to that battle, Washington, D.C. was burned to the ground by the British. So there's just a lot of interesting combinations here all of a sudden. Uh, and I looked at the date and I said, Some, there's something else to look at here. And it just so happens that it occurred on Holy Tuesday. And yes, there is a holiday. A, a, a Christians recognize, certainly the Catholics do, well, they call it Holy Tuesday. And it's when Jesus had, had entered Jerusalem the first time and then he went into the temple and then went back to Bethany and came back. And it commemorates when he cursed the fig tree. So I'm thinking, hmm. So let's take, we're just going to take a quick look at some of those scriptures. And I'm saying, Lord, if you're telling us something, what is it? You take down the bridge, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, our national anthem. And it collapses and takes down a lot of things with it. And it just so happens it ties us back to our history when Washington, D.C. was totally wiped out. So anyway... Let's go back and look at this real quick. The situation from uh, Holy Tuesday or Fig Tuesday. And this is out of Mark, Mark 11, 11 through 14. And he entered Jerusalem and came unto the temple. And after looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. So Bethany, by the way, the word Bethany means house of figs, no less. Um, and the next day... When they had departed from Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And he answered and said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. So it says that he was hungry. Well, what was he hungry for? And we got to realize... he. It just wasn't, I always hated that tree. I mean, that's just not, it, there's a significance here. It meant something. And we, if we understand what fig trees represent, fig trees basically at the time go back to the fig leaf, which is man's attempt to cover his own shame, which by definition is religion. So the fig tree is sort of, at this point, was religious Israel. And so he'd come in to where? Jerusalem, the capital, right? So to the temple, which was like the seat of government, if you will. And he said, hey, there, there's no fruit on this tree. And what was he looking for? Well, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So I believe the fruit he was looking for was righteousness. And he didn't see it when he looked in the temple the day before. So he comes back, and they came to Jerusalem and entered the temple and began to cast out those who were buying and selling in the temple. This is just a continuation. That word cast out is ekbalo, which is the same one to cast out demons, by the way. So he's casting out things who are selling in the temple and overturning the tables of the money changers and the seat of those selling doves. That's, in other words, you need a dove because you did something wrong. And so basically, I'm going to take advantage of your, shall we say, misfortune by selling you a dove because you're going to need that to get out of this. Uh, I don't know, you know you could, whether you consider that just religion, uh, pharmacai, I don't know. But basically, in this situation, you can see what he's talking about is this is supposed to be the, the house of prayer and the government of the whole uh, Jewish community. And yet, they were out there taking advantage of the problems of the people and using it to make money for themselves. So he would not permit anyone to carry goods to the temple, and he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? Isn't that interesting? For all nations. Do you understand? This is like a government. This was the government. When he says, my house, we always think of it as a religious structure. But you know he's coming back as king. So his house is actually government king. So imagine he just went into Washington, D.C. here and said, hey, um, my house is supposed to be a house 
of communion with me, in my words, for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den, the money changers. So he was dealing with something, and the chief priests and scribes heard this, and began seeking how to repent and say, oh, we're sorry, right? (laughs) Destroy him. Does that sound familiar in these days? Can you see they're not looking to repent? They've got, do you see this? viciousness about having to destroy. We're not talking about we don't like your what you're saying and we don't like your principles. No, they want to kill you. You know, and so we're looking at this and all of a sudden it's about destroying the people. For they were afraid of him and all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. There's a government out there that's the money changers and they're afraid of us. They're afraid of Jesus. And whenever evening came, they would go out of the city. Continuing on. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots up. So can you see the problem here and how the fig tree represented something? It represented a, a religious structure, a government, that was not producing the fruit that it was supposed to produce. And therefore, he said, this thing's got to change. You have made what I have given you a house of robbers. Now, I believe in a way that represents our nation. Because I believe we were founded on God's principles and purposes through our forefathers. But what has it been turned into? We got a lot of money changers, wouldn't you say? And if you come against them, are they going to listen to you? No, they're going to say, we we got to destroy that person. They're going to destroy our democracy. <laughs> and being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. This was his house. This is his nation. He founded it. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, now in the Bible, usually a mountain represents what? Government. That's right. As a matter of fact, isn't that what this was in Jerusalem? Where was he standing? Jerusalem. This mountain. Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. And it's interesting because in the Revelation, what does the sea mean? The people. Does that sound like what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the power from the administration and give it back to the people? Because that was his answer to cursing the fig tree. They took it and used it the wrong way, but it's supposed to be a house of my people. So he says, be taken up and thrown in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. And this fulfilled, of course, the prophecy of John the Baptist, the axe is already laid at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So I believe just by looking at this and saying, God, what are you saying? I can certainly see what he's saying to me. He's saying this is his house, and his house is supposed to be a communion to him and his words and the things that he established, because he's the one who built it and blessed it and has given us the prosperity that we're living in. And yet we have turned it into a den of robbers and thieves. So what would Jesus do? Well, here it is. And matter of fact, he turned over the tables of the money changers. So when I look at the situation that our national anthem, that the one who wrote all the glorious things about it, and that all of a sudden that's collapsed, I think it's a statement of what he's seen now, the fig tree that has not produced the fruits of righteousness, and that is our government. So I think that, I think it's cursed. I think it has to change. It doesn't mean that all's got to end. People say, well, you know, you put this American flag up because, you know, our nation's evil. I said, well, wait a minute. Look at the people who fly the American flag. And look at the ones who hate the American flag. Tell me which ones are the evil ones. Tell me which ones are the ones seeking God. No, we're believing in something that God established. 
and I believe that he says yes. We can speak unto this, and we can deal with this. And that's why, even through all of this, this is his red letters. Have faith in God. Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and it will be granted. So I want to finish up with the fourth verse of the Star Spangled Banner that uh, Francis Scott Key wrote that we never sing. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heavens rescued land. Praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God we trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. That's what he wrote. So, something's coming down, but something much greater is going up. Lord, we thank you for showing us and giving us an opportunity, Lord, to bring about the change that you're bringing for us. And thank you, Lord, for revealing your will and your truth to each one here. But, Lord, thank you for your red letters that give us the power to face this. And thank you for demonstrating, Lord, that if, it, if we have to curse the fig tree, then another, something greater will come. Because it was not bearing the fruit of what you originally designed for it. But, Lord, I believe we can and we will in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nathan? All right. See, here we are. We're tag teaming. So um, for those of you who go to abiding, um, you know, you've been a part of the School of the Supernatural. Um, I was asked to do a little section on Word of Wisdom. So we've been, we've been talking about the spiritual gifts at abiding. And we've been talking about that. Well, during this past session, now I didn't notice that this, the, the past session that I did was the second time that I've taught it, but it was, uh, I didn't notice until this time how much significance this has for our time now. And it's just, uh, and so what I wanted to do is, uh, I picked a few things out of there that I really wanted to share with you, and then I want to share how it relates to what's coming up. And, uh, and for those of you who were wondering why I laughed when James was talking about, you know, it'll destroy our democracy, uh, uh, look, I brought two mics just in case. Yeah, well, I changed the batteries just to see if maybe perhaps that was that, that's what it was. But, you know, I brought two just in case, just, just to see. So, um, but anyway, the reason why I was laughing when he said to destroy our, our democracy, do we live in a democracy here in this nation? No. I, and I know I'm preaching to the, to the choir. We are in a constitutional republic. At, but that's what they always say. And that's, that's a lie that they keep repeating in the news media constantly, constantly, because they want to enforce people to think that we live in a democracy. And I love that because it's like, uh, it, you know, uh, it was such a good joke, James, and maybe I was the only one who laughed at it, but I, I thought it was, was awesome because, you know, no, we live in a constitutional republic. And, um, you know, for and no matter how many times the lies come out, they're not going to get us to start saying that, right? We know the, the truth of it. So I wanted to read this part of the word of wisdom. Uh, where it comes from, so, uh, obviously, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. Now, to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the word of wisdom. That's where we get it. To another, the word of knowledge. And by the same Spirit, and to another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. And to another, the working of miracles. And to another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in various tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit who apportions them to each one as he determines. And so that's where we get the word of wisdom from. Um, but what is it? What is it exactly? Well, a lot of times people get really confused. The word of wisdom, um, people confuse it with simple wisdom in the affairs of life. But simple wisdom in the affairs of life is not 
a spiritual gift, right? No, it's not. It says in James 1.5, Now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So, that's all you have to do. If you want wisdom, you ask God. He gives it to you. That's natural wisdom, right? God has promised that this wisdom, which we'll simply call general wisdom to deal with the affairs of life, is available to everyone who will ask for it. God will impart wisdom, but that's not the supernatural manifestation of the word of wisdom. So what is it? Well, there's a difference between the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. And we've all heard, heard about these, these, things, these terms before. But the word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation by the Spirit of God concerning certain facts in the mind of God. Facts about people, places, or things in the past or present. And that's key right there, past or present. But the word of, the wis word of wisdom is a supernatural revelation by the Spirit of God of the future, a revelation concerning the plans and purposes in the mind of God. Okay? So it's a simple thing about God painting pictures for people, you know, giving them foreknowledge of things that are about to come. Well, the thing that I really wanted to uh, kind of harp on a little bit tonight and really kind of dig into is what's called a conditional word of wisdom. Okay, and I think this is where we are at right now in our nation. We have all signs pointing to God repeating a sign or adding to a sign telling us what's happening, what he's about to do, and he's given us the opportunity to change it. So, um, so I want to talk about a couple of incidents uh, in the Old Testament that were conditional words of wisdom, and then let's go ahead and dig into what's happening right now. So a conditional word of wisdom, uh, there were some incidents in the Old Testament when a prophet received a word from God which did not come to pass. Some manifestations of the word of wisdom are conditional depending on the person's obedience. Hezekiah is a great example. God told Isaiah to go and give him a word of wisdom concerning the future. The plan and purpose of God for Hezekiah's life under his present conditions, Isaiah was told to tell him in 2 Kings 21, set thine house in order for thou shalt shall die and not live. Whoa, who wants to get that word, right? No one. Well, <laughs> thank God. Uh, thank God, I don't think anyone here is going to give anyone else a, a word like that. But what was so awesome was that Isaiah delivered the message and then went on his way. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, repented of his wrongdoings, cried and prayed to God, reminded God that he had walked before God wholeheartedly in times past. And he told God that he had kept his commandments even though he had missed it in certain areas. And Hezekiah repented. And then before Isaiah even got out of the courtyard, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah again, telling him to go back, give Hezekiah another word of wisdom. And it was a word of wisdom because it still concerned his future, right? God said to Isaiah, tell Hezekiah, I am going to give him 15 more years. And you can find that in 2 Kings 25 and 6. And um, then the next one I want to talk about is Jonah and Nineveh. And I think this one directly relates to what is, what is happening for us. So um, God spoke to the prophet Jonah, gave him a word of wisdom that Nineveh was going to be destroyed if the people of the, of the great city did not repent and turn to God. This was a word of wisdom that Jonah received concerning the plans and purposes of God, and it was concerning a future event, the destruction of Nineveh. Jonah didn't care whether Nineveh got destroyed or not, and as a result, he didn't want to go to mourn the people. God dealt with him in the belly of a great fish, however, and he, then he went and preached to the people of Nineveh, warning them of impending judgment if they didn't turn to God. And that's Jonah 3, 4. The word Jonah gave to the Ninevites was conditional. If they repented, they would be spared. If they failed to repent, Nineveh would be destroyed. The people of Nineveh repented, and judgment didn't fall on Nineveh in that generation, although it did eventually come. And you can look in the book of Nahum with that, and it was uh, basically 70 years in the future when that actually happened. And what was really interesting, and this is, this is so fascinating, right? Um, look at the similarities between Nineveh and us, right? Nineveh was the capital of Assyria and was the superpower of her day. It required three days to circle metropolitan Nineveh, and the Ninevites lived large. They enjoyed the best chariots, the finest food, and the most exotic entertainment. It had an extensive business and commercial system like none in the world. In addition, Assyria had ruled the world for 200 years and was the strongest military power. 
Does that sound familiar? Wow, amazing. Well, what was so cool about this, um, and, and let's look at what actually happened. Uh, this, is, this is how Jonah presented it. So Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And that's in Jonah 3, 4. And then what was great was the king's response. When the king, uh, when the word eventually got, when Jonah's words eventually got to the king, he, uh, he called all the people together. And then in verse 9, he says, Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So, these are all signs. These are all signs that God is, is pointing to. And what I want to really look at here, when we're looking at words of wisdom, in this season, the enemy's releasing the spirits of manipulation and rebellion. He's twisting all the words that we hear, and we must be able to discern from the lies wisely, right? We must understand the signs and times and know how to move forward and overcome just as the sons of Issachar uh, did. And that's in 1 Chronicles 12.32. From the tribes of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives, and these men understood the signs and the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. So the Bible tells us that we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge, and if we aren't wise to the times and season we're in, then the enemy is going to steal, distort, twist uh, what is ours and what is truth, right? So we have to be able to have that word of wisdom activating in our life so that we understand the times that, that we're in. And so um, I really truly believe that this e eclipse is, is a sign from, from God. And um, there's a really fascinating thing. If you look back, and uh, this is a, a, a biblical... Um, this is uh, Dr. Scott Stripling from the Associates for Biblical Research. He says, uh, the ancient people saw celestial phenomena as omens. Using a dating system that intersects NASA data with the ancient Assyrian calendars, Associates for the Biblical Research says it shows an eclipse passed over Nineveh in the mid-8th century BC. That event was preceded and followed by a series of natural disasters. And lo and behold, what does the Bible show us? A renegade prophet named Jonah shows up, and he's preaching repentance at a time that they would be open to it, that normally they wouldn't because of the omen. So he, he explained this, that basically saying that back then they had signs in the sky, like this eclipse, and like I said, they intersected the, the, the Assyrian calendar with you know, our calendar and figured out that there was an eclipse right around that time, which made the people more receptive. And I think that's kind of what we're going to run into now, that... Don't just think it's the eclipse that's going to happen that's going to be a sign and an omen. I mean, we've scientifically seen the, these things, but I think there's going to be other manifestations around this eclipse and around things that are going on. Just like James showed you the calendar of events that was happening, we're going to be seeing much more of these things. But remember, it's, to, it's so that people will turn their hearts to God. And... Um, this is, I mean, you can't make this up. I want you to look at this and look at, 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 this, uh, at this map and look at how things are starting up. Starts up in Jonah, Texas, goes through Nineveh, Texas, Little Egypt, Illinois, uh, Nineveh, Indiana, Rapture, Indiana, Nineveh Township, Ohio, Nineveh, Pennsylvania, Nineveh, New York, Nineveh, Nova Scotia. I mean, is God saying something? I mean, you know, now, of course, when we look at the map and we see all these, all these different cities, uh, obviously, they're going to show the major metropolitan areas, but I don't think there's any coincidence that these towns are right along this, this path, and God is trying to tell us, pay attention, pay attention, that I'm saying something here, and you need to look at the signs, right? And so, why is God telling us? What's, what's he actually doing? Well, the purpose of a word of wisdom, there's three different purposes for it, right? God wants us to bear witness to something he's about to do. God is preparing us for something that's going to happen in the future. Or God's telling us so that we can seek to change the future event through prayer, which I think, of course, this is the latter one. God's telling us something that he's about to do so that we can seek him in prayer and intercession and seek to change his heart just like he did for, for Nineveh.
And then um, there's another fascinating thing about this. If you look at the paths of the last three eclipses, I know we've got this bigger picture back here too, but what's so, what's so amazing is that it forms two different sh um, shapes for Hebrew words, which is the tav and the aleph, right? Which also translate to the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's right there for you to see it. There's the tab and the left, and you can see it in the path right there of the, of the previous two eclipses and the path of the new eclipse that's right there. It's drawn right over America. He is the beginning and the end. And, and, and I'm telling you, God is bringing this out as a sign and a wonder so that we can, um, you know, we can have what we need to be able not only to, to show other, other people and present the gospel to them, but also so that we can get on our face and pray. And that's, what, that's why we're going to have these 40 days of prayer, because we want to seek God, we want to repent as the church, and we want to ask God to have mercy on our land. And if we will cry out to him, he will do it. He will do it. And that's why I think so many of these signs are pointing back to Nineveh, and, and to that, and, and so that we as a nation can understand that we're in the crossroads. We're in the crossroads right now, that if we don't get this, uh, get this settled now, that there, are, there is going to be a consequence. And I don't think, I, I, I don't know if America is going to make it through if we don't really settle in as the church and repent, and repent and seek him. So, um, Joanna, your turn. Your turn. Do you know how to operate this? Um, yeah. Okay. We'll figure it out. So I'm just coming to kind of tie it together. Um, I have a couple words. My words are more geared for the church. I feel like this specific time of intercession is specifically for the church. Um, yes, America's included in that because it's the Church of America. But I want to point out this. Um, so you see these two eclipses, right? You see 2024 and 2017. So uh, James has a theory, and um, looks like it's actually more than a theory, that um, many of you may know this or may not, but this eclipse in 2017, those towns it hit, they were all Salem's in them, Salem's. Now they're hitting all the Nineveh's. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I feel like the Lord is saying something. And, um, and we know in 2017, that was the beginning of um, 45's start. And um, we know that the powers that be cannot stand that. And, um, he, and he came in as a Jehu and began the process to operate and an authority to expose, right? So in 2020, there was a big pause. And quite frankly, it was a pause because God wasn't finished with a story. So in 2023, we decided right here, there was another one that went through Texas. There was a sign and a wonder here, a major flood that was devastating around that time. But when you look at the, the, what the, the Alpha and the Omega Hebrew word, what you look at as you come over here to Nineveh is that the Lord is saying, wake up, church. I need you on the wall. I need you to repent. One of the things we realized, we spent a lot of time in intercession during 2020 here in this place, and we kept expecting God to do something different, like get them to prove that things weren't accurate. You know, you know, the different things we were believing God for. There was enough, we knew there was enough evidence in our state alone to prove that things weren't on the up and up, but it was all over. And um, we were all coming together, we were reasoning together, we were praying, we were interceding. And I remember one night when the, the, our biggest hope, it was something with the Supreme Court, it didn't go our way for, the, for freedom. And then I felt the Lord's presence come on me and he's like, I'm not looking for the Ecclesia to repent. I'm looking for the church, the big C to repent. She has not repented. And that is where we're still at. 
He's still looking for that repentance. So I say, you would, the, the honest question would be, well, what can we do about that? What we can do about that is we can create an atmosphere in the spirit to bind every prince of body and power that would deceive them, blind them, or put them in a situation where they cannot hear the voice of God. And we can hold it back in the spirit prophetically so that they can hear the truth, the truth of the word of God, of what his designs are, and the truth of what the Lord's heart is for this nation and how important that that is. Because, you know, we have this religious theology out there. I don't even know it's theology, but this mindset that we're supposed to separate church and state. Well, that came in, but that didn't come in because it was Bible. It came in because it was deception. It was to keep us out of the mountain of government. See, we're called to be in every sphere of influence. God called us to rule and reign with Christ in human flesh on the earth, bringing the gospel of the kingdom with miracle signs and wonders so the world would be shifted and changed into his image, and then we would operate in that character and nature, and then the world would show his reflection. But the problem is, we, we went out of that one. We were told not to do that. And if we kept doing that, certain things would be withheld from, from the church. And so that threat worked out until 2020. And now I know many leaders now don't care about that threat. Because we know if we don't stand up for truth in the face of these things, we will not only lose our churches, we will lose our nation. And trust me, the devil doesn't want to just coexist with you. He wants to take over. He wants to kill. He wants to steal. And he wants to destroy. This is an antichrist spirit. This isn't just a work with me, we believe differently. This is you will worship me and my name is Satan. So this is really, truly what we've seen. So we've seen, we've been looking at a, revel, uh, we've been taking a tour of the book of Revelations. We're believing it's the revealing of the bride. But one day it will be the lamb coming back to earth. And um, so the, the words that um, I have that go along with that are geared a look um, to the church. So um, in November, God gave me this word. He said, my children, you're about to enter a season that you must know what you believe. Great deception has been released on planet Earth. And if it were possible, even the elect could be deceived. There is another gospel that is among you. And the enemy of your soul has released it to lead you astray. But I have allowed it to separate the wheat from the chaff. Judgment has been sanctioned by me to clean my house and make my bride beautiful. This twisting of my word will only deceive those who have not chosen to walk in my spirit. For my spirit will discern all things and separate the lie from the truth. I'm going to pause right there. This is why worship and, in our, and, and being in the presence of God is so important. Because we put oil in our spiritual lamps. And we're able to begin to understand the heart of our Father and who He is and what He's about. And the Lord can begin to weed things out of our heart that don't line up with who he is in the word. Because this is where the little foxes spoil the vine. They really do. When you start to get messed up in the little areas in your heart, it takes you a long way off course. So, um, so my spirit will discern all things and separate the lie from the truth. Lean into me in this season. Buy gold from me that has been tested in the fire of my presence. Put oil in your lamps so they do not go out. And stand in my truth and see your salvation, my bride, my glorious church. I believe we are in this season right now. We are seeing lots. How many of you, it doesn't take long to get on the different social medias and see all the belief systems, all the prophetic words. If you listen to every prophetic word, you would just have to turn around in a circle for days because you'll chase your tail. You've got to have discernment. It can create more controversy, honestly. And talk about end time beliefs. There are tons of end time beliefs. 
beliefs, but it doesn't matter what you believe because what you believe is how you're going to flow and where you're at. And I'm not saying that these beliefs will leave you away from Jesus, but they will definitely confuse you in this season. And um, But you've got to discern. You've got to take these things um, to the Lord. And then the next word I got in August of 2023 Sound the alarm, awaken the watchman. I am releasing acceleration. I am releasing an acceleration to see it an increase in the exposure of the wicked shepherds. I have tested their hearts and found them wanting. Therefore, I'm about to expose their deeds to the light. At the same time, I am raising up good shepherds that I have that have my heart. Those men and women will be given strategies from heaven to care, equip, and train the flock. Out of this group, a working model will arise for the five-fold ministry to prepare my fragmented church to be a glorious bride. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4. And I believe I want to end my part with this. This is where I believe we're going. I believe the Lord is now beginning to release a, the, the reality of what the five-fold wineskin is. And when I say that, most of you are familiar with the terminology, but for those of you who aren't, it comes out of Ephesians 4. Um, I'm going to start with 410. He who descended is the very one who ascended above the heavens in order to fill all things. And it was he who gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until... We all reach the unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God as we mature to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed about the waves carried around by every wind of teaching and by clever cunning of men in their deceitful scheming. Part of the solution for some of the problems is that God needs his church, the church he designed, the one he talked about on Pentecost, the one he, I, I will say he inaugurated on Pentecost, and we will be that end time fulfillment. I believe this is a prophecy. We've not seen, I know we've seen glimmer and glimpses of it where we've seen moves of the Spirit, but I have asked people who are, are have been in this a lot longer than me and are, are older than me, and uh, to our knowledge in the 19th, 20th century, we've not seen a working five-fold model where all of them together in unity were working collectively in a sphere, but it's it's not just one location, it's all the locations. It's his church, plural. You, you know, it's his gathering together, his meeting together, because this is the answer. And in the fivefold, this isn't like I have a gift of prophecy or I have a gift of teaching. This is when the Lord chooses people to be servants of him on planet earth to equip the rest of everybody else. It's not about the person. And see, what we've had, and I'm so grateful, we have had anointed men and women of God, but what happens is we've idolized them. And we put them on pedestals, so unfortunately the enemy was able to push them off. And, and um, a good friend of ours, Johnny Taylor, he has a great word and revelation about this. And he's like, we've got to stop doing that. Because we're, we're part of the problem. And, um, and, and one little thing, we've seen a little bit of this with the shepherds. How many of you are familiar with the craziness with IHOP KC and what's happened? And it's been very heartbreaking for most of us because I, I have some of my DNA about um, intercession, prayer, and worship from that. And the, and the truths, the things we've learned, they're, they're jewels. They're, they're straight from the Lord. But guess what? Mike's a human. He's a human being. And unfortunately, he got put on a pretty high pedestal. And when he fell, I am sure the Lord was dealing with him over the accusations. And I'll be honest with you, when it first came out, I thought, oh, the enemy's just going after him because of Israel. Because they did a big mandate to pray for Israel. But unfortunately, he made a confession.
and he owned to some of the allegations. I don't think everything, but some of them. And since then, a lot more has come out that seems credible. And so we have choice. We have a choice because this is going to keep happening because God is giving men and women to repent and if they don't he has to expose them but we have to make a choice we need to help people reconcile this so what we have to do is point them back to the truth these are human beings trying to do what God to call them to do and they're gonna fail we don't excuse it there there is we read what we sow and there needs to be accountability we need to allow the Lord to create a process that works with getting people repented and some people may not be able to come back in into the public sphere and teach and lead again because what they've done is it's too much it, it, it's just too much but in that we need to be working together but if we have a five-fold operation of this working together we're going to see less of that we are going to see less and less of that I'm not going to say we're never going to see it because we're in the sin nature so people are going to fall and we have a real devil that that tries to help us to do that. But but we're going to see less of that because we're going to create an environment where all aspects are being dealt with. And um, I wasn't overly familiar with how the the IHOP organization went, but it looked a lot from what I have, was told. I had friends there a lot like Jethro's model, where there were a couple of people, you know, at the top, and then a couple more people in the middle. But it never really was a relinquishing of authority, accountability, equipping, training. However, they had that day and night prayer and intercession and worship, which praise God because I. I believe because of that many people will be able to come away from this and their faith will not be wrecked but um, but that's why these things we're we're in a critical season so that is why we want we're serious about what we're seeing like God's looking for a response we want to be a part of the solution and um, each and every one of you if 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 we are awake in this hour you're awake for a reason because God needs your prayers. And yeah, I say God needs your prayers because he's not going to remove on anything that doesn't come from us. That's the order he set. We have that. So um, I think we want to do, do we have time for our song? And then we'll start our song and then we're going to set up here and do a little panel and get everybody included. <laughs> 